Well, a very good morning and good afternoon to everyone who is joining us from Asia and from Europe. Uh, we're so glad to have you for this discussion on explainable AI. I'm Cal Joff, and I'll be helping moderate today's session. This discussion today is part of a series on regulating AI, artificial intelligence, debating approaches and perspectives from Asia and Europe. Now, today we're going to be focusing on a critical challenge in artificial intelligence. AI systems are often open Okay. Frequently, we don't understand how they came to the recommendations uh, that they make, what assumptions that they're based on, and, and what is the logic connecting, really, uh, what goes in to what comes out, and uh, what makes AI, this technology that promises to be at the center of our lives, not just in consumer products, but in healthcare and government, uh, difficult to trust, right? And, and so if we don't understand AI uh, and how it is producing results, it also becomes challenging to understand what are some of those biases or, or weakness of those systems. Uh, uh, how can we uh, make use of it in policy and government and in all kinds of different sectors uh, in society? And a lot of, is at stake here because just in these early days of, of seeing AI applications scaled up, we've already heard stories of AI systems being biased um, uh, and including biases against underprivileged groups. So we have this fascinating emerging area of explainable artificial intelligence, a trustworthy artificial intelligence uh, that, that is coming out. And, and that's going to be a big focus of our discussion uh, for today. All of this is designed to foster public trust, um, effectiveness, and fairness. But before we get into that discussion, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about who is co-organizing today's uh, session. So the, the Henrik Boll Foundation, or HBS, is the Green Foundation from Germany, linked to the German Greens. Um, and it's dedicated to dialogue and exchange between Asia and Europe on themes of common concerns sustainability, energy policy, environmental prote protection. Um, HBS works in Germany uh, with its headquarters in Berlin, uh, as well as 35 offices all over the world, including the office in Hong Kong, which is co-organizing this event. Um, the other co-organizer is the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, or in short, APRU, which is a network of 60 leading research universities uh, that was established close to 25 years ago. And so the APRU network brings together university leaders and scientists to collaborate with policymakers, uh, industry, foundations, multilateral organizations to collaborate on all kinds of practical um, solutions to challenges in the Asia and Pacific region. It's a, it's a policy dialogue uh, kind of platform. Now, the APRU secretary is based in Hong Kong, and its member universities are located in 19 countries across Asia, Southeast Asia, Australasia, um, North and Latin America. So do if you're going to uh, post some things on uh, social media about these uh, uh, this event, do tag HBS and APRU on them. Um, let's talk a little bit about who's here today. Uh, joining us, we have a fantastic audience from all over Europe and Asia Pacific. We've got policymakers, we've got academics, researchers, and interestingly, also a number of people who have joined us from civil society organizations. And of course, we have our uh, panelists and our speakers uh, for today. So we have uh, Professor Matthias Ketterman. He's the head of the research program at the Hans Bredow Institute in Germany. Um, and he's a professor of innovation theory and philosophy of law uh, and the head of Department for Theory and Future of Law at the University of Innsbruck, Austria. We have Professor Liz Sonnenberg, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor for Systems Innovation at the University of Melbourne in Australia. And Liz is also a member of the Advisory Board of AI Magazine and the Standing Committee on uh, the Standing Committee of the 100-Year Study on Artificial Intelligence. And then finally, we are joined by Dr. Brian Lim. He is Assistant Professor of Computer Science uh, at the National University of Singapore. He leads the NUS UbiComp Lab that's focused on research on ubiquitous computing, explainable artificial intelligence for healthcare, wellness, and uh, smart cities. So just a few notes uh, uh, as we start. Number one, today's session is recorded. Two is we had a very active conversation in the chat in our last session. So I really encourage everyone to post your thoughts um, and questions into the chat or using, you, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's the Q&A button as well, so dedicated for questions. Um, and I'll be looking out for some of those questions uh, as we go into the conversation. So feel free to post questions anytime. Uh, I'm gonna keep on watching those two areas. Now, to help us uh, kick off the conversation, I mean, perhaps we can start with uh, Professor Sonnenberg. Uh, Professor Sonnenberg, why do we want AI to be explainable to society? And, and really, why are we here? What's hard about getting to explainable AI? Well, th thanks, Carl. Thanks for the introduction. And, and as you've noted, um, in the past few years, AI has very much left the laboratory and entered our everyday lives. 
There are many stories of AI success, but algorithms are trained with data sets and proxies. And developers too often and unintentionally use data sets with poor representation of the relevant populations. And so their outputs of their algorithms are biased. Some of you may have heard of the uh, system Compass. This is a software tool that's used across the US justice system to predict the risk that a criminal defendant will reoffend. Advised by the scores generated by this software, a judge will decide whether or not to detain the defendant prior to trial. The algorithm for Compass is proprietary and secret. The input used for prediction uses 137 different factors, age, gender, criminal history, and other matters. It does not use race as an explicit feature, but there's a lot of analysis, published analysis, that suggests that the algorithm operates in a racially biased way. So derived properties from these 137 possibly neutral sounding uh, characteristics turn into potentially biased analyses. Now, the owning company disputes this, but nevertheless, there's quite a lot of uh, literature around it. As a simple example, uh, it's argued that uh, black offenders are almost twice as likely as white offenders to be labelled by the system as a high risk, but actually not go on to reoffend. So these kinds of analyses lead us to questions of fairness uh, of algorithms and how it should be defined and assessed. But I've been asked to talk about ex explainable AI or XAI for short. That's an umbrella term for the various techniques that are being trialed to enable AI applications to provide outputs that enable humans to understand why the system has made particular decisions. So I'll briefly comment on the what, the why, and the how of explainable AI, and along the way, point to some aspects that uh, my fellow, fellow panelists will elaborate on. So first, the what. And let me start with a very simple example, just to make it concrete. Consider a credit scoring application that interacts with a consumer whose loan application has been refused. An XAI enabled system would not only provide the recommendation, but would enable the customer to ask the system, what could I do differently to get a positive outcome? An XAI system might draw on the internal parameter-driven decision-making to compare the profile of the customer with those of customers with similar but different attributes, and then might respond, well, you're currently holding three accounts with a cumulative debt of say $5,000, if you consolidated the accounts and repaid half the amount, then the loan would be approved. And yes, that's an overly simple example, but perhaps is enough to have you appreciate that more sophisticated XII could enable um, various stakeholders in the uh, system application and adoption to better understand why a prediction is made, and in doing so, increase user trust and hence increase AI adoption. And importantly, XAI is more than just an optional extra. As you'll hear more about from our second panelist, Matthias Kettleman, European legislators are seeking to restrict applications of AI, which will further drive the need for insight, transparency, and governance. And as you've asked, uh, Carl, uh, generating useful explanations is a very hard problem. And I'll just briefly comment on three facets of the difficulty. First, there are major technical challenges. Machine learning systems can be difficult to comprehend even by the developers of those systems, as you hinted at. Compass that I mentioned uses 137 parameters and that's deemed to be complex, but systems can actually be built with thousands and sometimes millions of parameters. And so it's virtually impossible to derive precise reasoning from such models. And machine learning, of course, isn't the only form of AI technology in use, but even rule-based systems that seem to lend themselves to explanation generation more naturally because they're encoding knowledge in some way, are also not able generally to be able to generate useful explanations. An audit trace of the rules that are applied uh, to arrive at a decision is not generally meaningful to a user, and finding ways to abstract the information meaningfully is hard. Uh, XAI technologies are being actively researched, as you'll hear, but the field is relatively immature. The second difficulty sits around 
um, the human experience of what it means to provide a good explanation of some complex phenomenon to another person. As the explainer, you have to not only understand the rationale for the decision, but you need, even to, need to be able to understand what the other person already knows and doesn't know about the situation, provide appropriate information at an appropriate level of detail, not too simple, not too complex, and then be able to elaborate with more information on request. And you'll hear more from our third pa panelist, Brian Lim, about what it takes to develop high quality machine generated explanations. And the third difficulty sits around um, the deployment of such systems. Having highly trained professionals in any field adopt new technologies is a socio-technical challenge, and it's not unique to AI systems. There's a vast literature uh, on intelligent decision support systems and human systems engineering that demonstrates that the way in which information is presented to the decision makers can ha have a significant effect on performance. But even when systems are highly accurately, highly accurate, and their performance exceeds that of human experts, because the internal decision processes are not inspectable or explicable, the human decision maker may or may not have confidence in the system's advice for good reason or otherwise. And so paradoxically, the human whose um, objective performance may be less than that of the AI software is a gatekeeper that for good reason, perhaps, is preventing that software for being, for being used. And arguably, XAI is one key to bridging this gap. So for successful adoption of AI applications, particularly in high stakes settings, oversight is necessary to ensure there's responsible, ethical and fair practices in place. The ever improving technical capabilities of AI are a double edged sword, but I at least am optimistic that the positives will outweigh the negatives and that XAI will be an important element in achieving progress. So I hope that begins to answer your questions. Fantastic. And, and thanks so much for laying out those, those three challenges. Um, and also just, you know, how high the stakes are, right? We're, we're really hearing that already some of these systems have life uh, altering uh, effects and, and uh, sometimes in, in very problematic ways. I, I'd like to turn to Professor Ketterman. Professor Ketterman, you've been working on a large um, explainable AI project over the past, past five years. C can you tell us a little bit about what you're learning from that that could help us inform how we make policy around explainable AI? How do, how do we ensure that this uh, gets implemented and, and designed well? And you, you're, you've been watching some of the sort of policy moves in, in the EU around this. How, how does you know, what you think ought to be happening compare to what is, is happening uh, uh, when it comes to the EU's policy moves on explainability? Thank you so much for, for having me. To your, to your first question, um, indeed, we've been uh, working on a, a number of, of projects dedicated to finding out how to best explain AI-based decisions. What we noticed right away was that it's not a good idea to leave the design of those uh, explanations to either lawyers or tech people or uh, decision uh, and program and, and uh, designers. What you have to uh, be aware of is that explanations are extremely uh, challenging to design well and to implement well. Uh, just ask yourself the question, you know, if you take a decision, um, how uh, do you explain that decision? Uh, is it actually what your, uh, what, your, what your reasons are or is that what you think your reasons might be? And then you have to transpose that to a system, so obviously it's going to be difficult. So what we need to make sure is that any approach to designing um, explanations um, of for AI-based decision making is an interdisciplinary endeavor that includes uh, law, tech, and includes also design thinking. Because obviously, we have to think about what kind of information do people need, right? Uh, they don't actually need to know all of the parameters. They need to know how they could change their behavior or what aspects of their behavior or of the data which was available for them influenced the decision on uh, whether they can do anything about that. That's the information they actually do want to have. Um, and indeed, we um, are increasingly seeing the importance of the underlying right to explanation. We all um, have a, a, a right to um, 
to do justification if an entity, be that a state or a machine, uh, influences how we live our lives, influences uh, the way that uh, rights and goods are distributed among individuals and among societies. This right to justification um, is implemented through, uh, partially through um, explain, explanation of AI-based decisions. We're only seeing the very first steps uh, globally towards uh, the implementation of that right. And I believe it's one of the key challenges uh, of, um, of, the, of the next years to make sure that people um, um, are not, uh, do not feel uh, powerless against uh, towards uh, AI-based decision because that breeds distrust and insecurity. Um, coming to your second question, this is sort of in the background of quite a number of uh, normative approaches, of legislative approaches taken by the European Union. Uh, chief among them, of course, is the AI Act, uh, but I don't think we should talk too, too much about that. It's a very detailed act. It has the different risk categories. It's extremely interesting. But if you look at the explanation dimension, I think this is where um, we really see a, a advances happening. Um, and the advances are ironically not in the AI Act, but rather in accompanying acts that uh, impact uh, platform um, governance more broadly. So, for instance, in uh, the most recent uh, Digital uh, Services Act, there are clauses. Uh, that's a European Act that um, that that is, uh, defines certain rules for for um, online platforms for digital services providers. You know, think everything from uh, Google to Meta to Twitter to TikTok. Um, those companies are obliged to um, provide insight into the logic of the recommender algorithms they use. And I think that's a huge step. Up to now, states said, okay, you have to delete illegal content, but what you do with non-illegal content is basically up to you. You know, It might be lawful and awful, but you can use your own algorithms and recommend something and uh, make other things disappear. This has led to phenomena like disinformation. This has enabled uh, uh, crime, um, well, um, certain kinds of crime online to persevere. And I believe this trend towards ensuring that people know more about how platforms operate through a duty to have um, more information about recommender algorithms is the first step towards such a, towards a more law-based uh, um, platform order. And I'm very happy to engage on that question also with the with the audience. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Ketterman. And I just wanted to ask a quick follow up on that. So the, the rights that and the duties that you have mentioned, do they already exist? Are they already in, inscribed into law or, or, or are these things that you think ought to be uh, put into place? Thanks for the for the excellent follow up. Partially, they are already in law. So, for instance, in the uh, General Data Protection Regulation, there is already now a duty for those who have uh, who, who have automated decision making um, uh, engines to provide people whose data is uh, used uh, in those processes automatically um, with an explanation about the logic of the underlying algorithm. This is not implemented all the time because there's a small uh, get out because if you include a human somewhere in the whole process uh, this this uh, this this absolves the the, the people using the ai based uh, decision making engine of that duty but it is already in the law but the majority of new clauses are going to be coming uh, to 2023 2024 fascinating thanks so much for for sharing that and i think we'll definitely want to come back to this Dr. Lim, coming to you, you know, one of the three key challenges that Professor Sonnenberg mentioned earlier was the human experience of what it means to provide a good explanation. And now I know a focus of, of your work is in cognitive psychology and in perceptual uh, processes. What are we learning from that? What are you learning from that that can help us inform how to build quality explanations or, or, or at least how to um, design systems that can give us quality explanations? Thanks, Carl, for the uh, opportunity to answer that uh, question. So, um, yeah, my, my research is in human computer interaction, and we build technologies that are usable for people, right? And given how prevalent AI is and how um, important it is to provide explanations, we now look at that as a usability problem, right? At a high level, you can think of it as this is we delegate. Um, 
duties to AI, right? And um, if we delegate it to a human, they have to justify their reasons. So um, we are looking into how can we get the AI to generate their explanations the way that a human would. So I have a few slides that I like to share uh, that can help to clarify a bit of what we've been up to. So um, here's just an example of a medical uh, doctor or a model of one, um, but let's consider a medical application, right? That's going to predict whether a patient uh, has a high mortality probability or low, right? Whether the patient's going to die. And so the AI predicts this and the doctor says, oh, that's nice to know, but uh, are you sure? Like, why did you make this explanation, uh, this prediction? So it can then generate this as an explanation. And this is quite state of the art now. This is uh, using a method called line. And um, on the left here, though, you see um, it uses decision rules. And on the right, it says which of these rules or features are more important, right? And these are not important. These are very important. So uh, these are what the uh, machine learning scientists and engineers are coming up with. Uh, but Think about this from a medical doctor, right? They're very smart, but they go through and understand biology and human disease. Do they know how to interpret these explanations? Is this how they share uh, explanations with one another? No, they, they think in different ways, right? Um, despite that, there's been plenty of uh, explainable AI uh, algorithms that's been generated uh, developed in the past few years, right? And uh, you can classify them as these different uh, fundamental approaches to, to understanding, uh, but it's, it's getting very messy. And I was wondering, uh, you know, uh, why do we need such a diversity of explanations, right? And for that, we turn to uh, human psychology uh, and philosophy. So here, we, by understanding people and by understanding what are the reasoning processes uh, from philosophy, right, regarding how people think and how they explain to one another and how they actually think, you know, from uh, theories and psychology, we can then inform how we should be designing explainable AI, right? So it's not just that the scientists are so smart and they come up with all sorts of arbitrary explanations. Uh, it should be guided by these underlying reasoning processes. So from here, we can then identify how people should reason and explain to each other and how uh, to generate uh, explainable AI to satisfy those needs. We also learn about how humans actually reason. So we're not uh, perfect in our decisions. We try to be efficient instead. And with that, we suffer from cognitive biases and we make decision errors. So then we look into how can we use explainable AI to mitigate those errors, right? So with that, uh, the AI and, and human working together, they're able to reduce their decision errors and make better decisions. And here we're able to then tailor uh, how specific explanations can augment or enhance human reasoning. Um, so you have a lot of details in the paper. If you want to see, uh, there's, there's a lot uh, of difficulty with how to, how to do this. And our paper goes into some details of how to uh, make those connections. So this is one example where understanding how human thinking can guide how we should design explanations. I'd like to also introduce another example here. So let's say we have, um, you know, Amazon Alexa that listens to our voice uh, and it can predict uh, our emotional state and maybe recommend the, the right music for us. So let, let's hear this example. Dogs are sitting by the door. So in this case here, uh, we have an AI that predicts that that voice sounds particularly fearful, right? And, and so imagine if you're, about going, you're going about your day and it predicts this, you wonder, hmm, why do you think uh, I'm fearful today, right? So you may ask that question and say, here's an explanation for that, right? Uh, so I, I understand a lot of you may struggle to understand what does that mean, right? It's a complicated diagram. Uh, it's formally known as a spectrogram. And if you have training in electrical engineering, you'd understand uh, it shows you how frequency changes over time. And then we show a heat map over that, right? So this is a rather technical uh, but popular method that a lot of scientists have developed to explain AI. Um, but obviously this is not good enough uh, for your lay audience. Right, so currently, explainable AI lacks human interpretability. In general, they are too technical, uh, they're not relatable, and they're not human-like. And this tends to happen when engineers or scientists develop applications for, for end users, right? So um, XAI is a pretty new field, um, and it's being led with a very technically minded uh, community. And so they, they, they still uh, suffer from this, but you know, hopefully uh, things will get better over time. So I argue that explanation should be re relatable uh, to the concepts that we know, to the examples that we're familiar with and to certain cues or related information so that we can make sense of how the machine is thinking. 
right? So this is a nice uh, collection of ideas here. But then I asked further, uh, why do we as humans care about this? And once again, I turned to human psychology to understand this. And from that, we identified the theory of human perceptual processing, right? That guides how given a stimulus, we process information in a certain way, and then we interpret it. So from there, we are inspired to create the XAI perceptual processing framework. And let me tell you how it uh, works. You imagine that you look at a, a scene. In this case here, I'm not going to describe what it is yet. right? So that's a stimulus. And then our brain actually selects certain parts about it, not everything. right? And from that, then we look at certain shapes and we say, hey, I know what that is. That's an ear. That's an, an eye. That's a nose, right? So our brain is organizing uh, that information. Then after that, it goes into the interpretation phase where it's able to recall certain uh, related information. So let's say here, a cat and a dog. And then it says, well, let me recall what the ears or eyes or nose of a cat or that of a dog looks like. And then let me compare what I see to what I remember. And then I realize that it's closer to the signals for a cat. Therefore, I conclude that I can categorize what I'm seeing as a cat, right? So this is a demonstration of how the human perceptual processing works. And then we look at that and we think, can we get the AI to process like that too, right? And indeed, we realize that there are existing technical approaches that line up with some of these steps here, right? And with that, we're able to then develop this complicated uh, deep neural network here. Don't worry, but this is what the machine learning engineers would do. But he, over here, we're able to modularize it and say it has components that satisfy the specific explanation objectives, right? So here we can say this part plugs into that and this information plugs into the next step and so on and so forth. So this now we have an architecture that is interpretable by design, right? And we can say that this thing like a human. And by designing AI or AI explanations that are human-like, we aim for the users to trust the AI uh, more because it is just like us. So in conclusion, uh, you know, I, I argue that it's important to, oops, it's important to consider expl explainable AI uh, from the human psychology point of view, and also what is technically possible with AI, and combine them using HCI techniques so that we can bridge between the two fields and develop explanations that are more human-centered, that real people, whether you're lay users or a domain expert, can interpret, and then you can truly trust and delegate uh, more duties to AI. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Dr. Lim. And I'm going to go to some of the questions that we have coming into the chat already, because we've got some really interesting ones. And one of them, um, I think, gets to the heart of, of kind of what is an, an explanation. Um, uh, so what I find so fascinating about this discussion so far is that these, these new technologies are, are forcing us really to return to first principles around philosophy, how we think, how we reason. Um, uh, and, and so this is uh, just very interesting. But to, to Professor Sonnenberg, you know, we've got Rita asking, um, in empirical research that uh, uh, she has done, XAI in healthcare, they found that clinicians and patients don't really want technical explanations on how, for example, an AI diagnostic tool has made a decision. What they want to know is, is it accurate? Is it approved by regulatory authorities? Uh, uh, is, it, is it clinically um, tested? And, and so I guess my question here would be, when we talk about an explanation, uh, especially an explanation that is geared towards strengthening trust, um, what, what do we mean? And, and uh, uh, is is it something that is needed, for example, in these healthcare settings? Hmm. So I, I think there are two parts to this question. There's what does the clinician need in order to be able to take advantage of the, um, the analysis that the AI algorithm has provided as value add to an image or a set of tests? And what does the patient need? And I think they're different answers. Um, the use of... Um, or what, what, uh, I'll give a very um, simplistic view of what a clinician does. A clinician is synthesizing a blend of raw and processed data, it might be test results and, and a variety of other inputs, what they know about the patient history and so on, and they bring their expertise to create a conclusion in that context. And often, uh, it's not a sole decision by a clinician, it might be a group of just clinicians with complementary expertise and so on. And on top of that, there's extensive training, extensive debriefing, and so on. What the XAI approach does is provide a form of a bridge between the very raw data, 
um, and the process data and allows a clinician or a group of clinicians to drill down to understand what sits underneath the recommendation, which they then subsequently will apply their expertise to synthesize with other information and then abstract that appropriately to the patient. So um, the, uh, the role of XAI is to support the uh, confidence building of the clinician who in turn can then translate that as they see appropriate to the patient. It's not imagined in, in the health situation at least that that would go directly to the patient. Um, just as uh, clinicians need to be trained in, in the example um, as to how to interpret an MRI, um, the algorithms that sit behind an MRI, very advanced image processing algorithms, indeed, they don't need to know that, but they do need the certification. And the issues that uh, Matthias was talking about do sit around the accuracy, the certification, the oversight, and so on. And for the regulators to feel confident that they can put a certification stamp on an algorithm, they need to be able to probe beneath that, just as the engineers who build the MRI machines need to be certified themselves. So I think there are many layers to, to the answer. Thanks very much for that. And, and I, it sounds like uh, one of the key distinctions that you're making is between, let's say, something that provides a, a, a readout, an, an image like an MRI might, which is a much more direct sort of input-output relationship versus something that is producing a, a recommendation where we probably want to understand you know, what, it, what is happening in, in the layer underneath in order to trust it. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, I think that's definitely one element. I think there's a... Uh, a a need to drill into a proposed answer uh, and that need from a clinician would be very different from a, the need from a patient. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Liz. Matthias, I I'm going to come to you and I want to um, I want to touch a little bit on what you talked about in terms of these policies that are coming down the pipeline, because that's that's very interesting. And so it sounds like th there's a bit of a roadmap uh, of policies. We're starting to build a picture of, of what do we want from AI, right, around explainability from, you know, from what uh, Liz, from what Brian has talked about. Um, now, when it comes to policy, of course, it should play a role to enable us to get those things that, that we want, of course. If you had uh, the ability to define the policy roadmap for the EU, let's say, around explainable AI, what would be some of the things that you would like to see in it? Um, and what are you uh, uh, sort of learning from the work that you're doing that you think ought to end up in something like a, a policy roadmap for the EU on explainable AI? Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for the, for the question. So I, I definitely uh, think that um, explainable uh, AI has to be taught very early on. So uh, any roadmap, shouldn't start at the at the end right shouldn't start at the at the uh, at the result of an automatic decision and then sort of work its way back right we'd rather have to start at the opposite end we have to start we have to see we have to look at the, the role of ai in society as a societal issue that we have to address on the one hand by by education uh, through through our schools through our um, through all, all life cycle, uh, all the whole pedagogical pedagogical life cycle, and secondly, we have to um, we have to start looking at the whole AI process. And any any sound EU policy, any sound uh, AI policy, um, would start asking the very question at the beginning when you know when 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 data to be included in learning data is selected. You know how does that play into the um, into the explainability? How does that play into our, our tools that we can then use to explain decisions? It's really hard to do that uh, ex post. You know, Dr. Lim has so beautifully described how that can be done, but it's much easier to start from the very beginning and also ask yourself, for instance, so who set up the team that decides on which training data is used? You know, there's always one question that 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 uh, influences how that works out. So my call would be, my ideal a policy would be one that is much more holistic, that is more societally oriented, and that takes from the importance of explaining and justifying any AI-based decision, that then uses that knowledge, that conviction to adapt fundamentally how we approach the design of AI systems. Uh, thanks, and I want to I want to press you a little bit more on that one because it, it's such a rich and, and and I think deep area. So I, I'm hearing education, right? That that sounds uh, really key, and, and early education as well. 
but who uh, or, or kind of what types of AI do you think are most critical that we have uh, explained? Do, do you think that there should be policies that, let's say, insist that uh, uh, certain classes of AI be explainable and certain classes perhaps need not be explainable. I mean, Rita just asked a, another question around facial recognition technologies, right? Can facial recognition technologies provide meaningful explanations uh, uh, in, in what they're doing? Or is that perhaps a, a different class? So are, are we already kind of thinking about certain categories in which we would like to see um, an insistence on, on uh, explainable AI? Yeah, so yeah, absolutely, we we will definitely have to categorize. Uh, that's uh, the um, the uh, European approach anyway, right? And it's in the AI Act. It uh, it uses classes to um, to simplify the challenge of of, of rules or of um, of developing rules for AI. So yes, I also think that depending on the impact that a decision has on your life, obviously you'll have different. Uh, you'll have different demands regarding uh, explainability. That doesn't change from the offline world, right? Depending on the kind of judgment you get, right? It's either very, very short explanation or a uh, short reason, or perhaps even no reason at all, which is in certain circumstances okay, right? Um, but then if it's an important decision, then there's a long reasoning. There's always has to be a proportionality, you know, between the impact a decision has and your ability to fight against it. Just, you know, one last sentence, there was a an interesting case in Germany a couple of years ago when somebody tried to get out of a, a ticket, a speeding ticket, right, uh, for I think 15 euros, so like uh, $16, 16 US dollars, and he wanted to fight that speeding ticket. And the police said, "Well, we can't, you know, we can't actually, uh, we can't allow you, to, we can allow you in the proceeding to criticize or to question the." The AI under uh, underlying our our um, uh, underlying the uh, the mathematical model from which we uh, uh, from which we come to the conclusion that you've driven too fast because you know we the computer doesn't save all of that information it just deletes everything data sensitive right away and the Supreme Court of one German land then said well that's not enough people have to have the ability to question how decisions are reached you know, right um, and this is something which I think is an important point to to, to keep in mind whenever anybody any entity any any machine impacts how you live your life which goods and values you have then you have to have that explanation provided to you fascinating thanks so much uh brian i want to come to you and and hear what your ideal roadmap looks like now from perhaps from a, a more asia uh, or singapore even perspective i know singapore has done quite a bit of work in this space um but but are there things that you would like to see in let's say over the next three to five years in ai policy explainable ai policy i should say yeah so thanks um i would consider that uh, at a higher level every country that's a uh, or a region that's um, applying AI would fundamentally try to go to its uh, um, you know, similar high-level goal. A uh, slight different in, in Asia, I guess, is that we are a little bit less sensitive towards um, privacy uh, concerns. Uh, though, uh, let's say in Singapore, so we're very interested in, in propagating our techniques to, to around the world. So, so the concerns uh, internationally are also highly relevant to, to us. Uh, but without the, the privacy uh, concerns at the forefront that it does enable uh, more capability development um, first, right? So, um, in uh, one of the first things that we need in, uh, you know, to to do is explainable AI or AI is uh, to have lots of data and reliable data. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, one of the early users of uh, XAI is also to identify are there biases or is my data uh, good? Uh, the, the the truth is. Uh, most likely the data is not good enough, right? So we're still at a stage where we want to use XAI to find out where are the problems in my data and where are the biases in my models, right? So uh, that should be covered uh, first. And then after that, once we have a good process to, to clean the data and ensure um, a good data quality, right? Then we can look into, uh, you know, does the AI reason uh, in a way uh, that uh, you know, the domains that they apply to, you know, um, that, that it uh, follows the standards in that domain, right? So I, I like the, the medical one because I feel it's a, it's a pretty important domain where it's life or death. Um, and the way I look at it is, uh, you know, the, the doctors understand uh, certain biological processes, uh, not just about variables, but they understand certain processes and causal mechanisms, right? And so uh, the AI should try to reason in a similar way. Um, extending that idea also, I see um, explanations as really, um, it's just uh, one signal to try to understand 
uh, what's going on in your data. So I, I do believe that ultimately the human needs to interpret. So whether they interpret it through visualizations, through um, explanations, or just through rigorous study um, of their, their models, um, you know, they are uh, the accountable ones, right? So here we're looking into how can uh, explainable AI perhaps accelerate that, right? So that the human can compile a, a reasonable, uh, justifiable, defensible answer. And so, Brian, just uh, to check two things, uh, and so I make sure I'm understanding this correctly, you're talking about humans and AI partnering to generate explanations, not just the AI generating that explanation. Is that right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, at the level where the AI really has to defend itself, then it should be a human AI partnership. I mean, the, the, all the explanations need to be interpreted. Um, and so ultimately, uh, some human has to do it. Um, of course, mm -hmm. I understand there are many applications where you want to automate without uh, the human being present, right? But in the rare case that uh, something exceptional happens, uh, we want the ability that a human can go in and, and really squeeze out a, a deep understanding of what's happening. That, that's really interesting. And it, it sounds like, um, a whole new uh, set of careers that will emerge of, of people whose job it is to, you know, work with AIs to generate explanations, which ties to Matthias's, Matthias's point about, uh, you know, the early education to make sure that we, we've got we've got that talent, you know, perhaps that is uh, uh, being developed. The, the second thing I just wanted to follow up on, uh, Brian, is you talked about the differences in, uh, let's say, values around privacy uh, between these two regions, broadly speaking. Does the difference, let's say, does the different threshold for privacy um, in this region, in Singapore, uh, uh, does that have an impact on explainability or, or is it not relevant? Um, yeah, so uh, you're asking about whether privacy affects the, the usefulness of uh, explanations. In fact, uh, some of the research also I've looked into is the, the conflict between these two requirements. So at a high level, uh, privacy means share less data and explanation means share more data. So, so they're gonna conflict uh, each other. We, in fact, we found that uh, if you uh, have a, an AI model that can explain, there are many sophisticated methods now that can uh, invert a, a model prediction and then find out the source data, right? So, so some privacy researchers are demonstrating how easy is it to, to leak information even if it's not explicit. Um, so I, I see here that um, definitely that there, uh, this is a difficult thing to, to solve. Um, one other view we can take also is that uh, you know, we, we don't need to have automation um, at every step of the way or that explanations don't have to be provided to everyone, right? So if let's say uh, you would provide explanations to a technical uh, sub-community uh, who are trusted, right, then they can uh, interpret what's going on and to uh, the public or perhaps where the adversaries may lie, right? Uh, if you, they do not have access to these explanations, then we still have uh, more privacy, right? Uh, but this assumes that we have a, uh, some authority figure that we are willing to, to share more, more data to. And I understand in some countries, uh, even that is not quite so acceptable. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. And, and Liz, I, I'd love to hear from you on, on that, actually, the, the coming back to the socio-technical uh, challenge and perhaps socio-technical, political, economic uh, uh, challenge. You, you know, we, we've got private companies and, and vendors to government saying, you know, sorry, our algorithm is proprietary and we can't share it to you. And even if we did, um, you know, it, it wouldn't be able to, to make sense of it. And we have, you know, do we really, or, or we can, you know, create an explanation, but perhaps it, it is not actually a genuinely uh, uh, useful um, explanation. In some cases, these companies are larger than countries, uh, entire GDPs, right? Um, and particularly as we're looking at regions like Southeast Asia, lots of um, uh, sort of small countries uh, uh, in this region. What do you see as the future for regulating uh, uh, these types of organizations? Do you think we will be able to demand the kinds of, you know, the design of AI that leads to the kinds of explanations that we're hoping to see? So I, I think that uh, this problem of uh, super large uh, corporations acting in their own interests as opposed to national or global interests uh, isn't just about AI. We look at uh, tax practices of large companies. Uh, we look at um, the um, opportunities and challenges associated with uh, cryptography and the hiding of secrets and so on. I think uh, we, we, we are starting to see that governments uh, see the 
importance of working in some cases collectively to impose regulation with a variety of penalties that they can that they're able to do and so i think there's an important distinction between um, a company being forced to disclose uh, its you know, algorithm at a certain level of, of, of detail to a regulator as opposed to to a uh, to the public in some way so i think it um, the notion of some kind of in escrow type of um, layered uh, disclosure to an appropriately trusted regulator, I think will be coming into the future if it's not already. And I'll leave Matthias to comment as to, to what extent it might already be in play. Uh, I think that's the way that uh, will occur, but it will only occur if governments are um, acting collectively and very insistently. And we've seen mixed outcomes of that so far. Interesting. So, so governments acting collectively as in uh, regional or let's say multi-country partnerships uh, exactly. aligning AI policies? Yeah. Yes, indeed. And, and Matthias, coming back to you, I mean, the EU is of course an example of, of this uh, collective action. Uh, how's that going? <laughs> what could we learn, you know, perhaps in the Asia region from attempts to, to do that collective action? Are you seeing that there are perhaps spoilers um, in uh, uh, attempts to create uh, the right kinds of uh, EU policy amongst EU members? Are there, you know, important learnings that we ought to take away from the EU experience? Well, it's a bit difficult to compare, you know, uh, for instance, ACN and EU, you know, uh, from, the, um, uh, from the, the basic legal setup. To, to the political uh, um, the dynamics. Um, uh, the, the biggest advantage the EU has is that once it reaches agreement, um, it, uh, it passes law that has a, a direct effect on, on all member states. So the member states don't have to individually find, um, uh, subscribe to, to the law. Um, I think one, one potential spoiler would be um, to, to overcomplicate things, right? To listen, to, to only talk to, to, to technological experts and not also to keep in mind the, um, the societal impacts of, um, of, of explainable um, AI. Um, but I don't see that happening right now. I think that there's actually the, the whole digital package that you are right now proposing from the D Digital Services Act to the Digital Markets Act to the Data Act to the Data Governance Act and to the AI Act. I don't have time for my family either. either. No, um, that all of that together um, is a pretty pretty decent uh, package uh, towards a more uh, a more rights based um, international order. The problem which I see is that um, if if if, come, if if I think you should do a much better job in engaging other regions when it comes to developing those rules, because both with regard to data and with regard to AI, it's not like uh, there's a, a European uh, data space, a, a European AI space where we can set the rules ourselves and everybody will uh, automatically subscribe to them. It might work in certain regards. You know, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation has been rather successful globally, but um, we're still, I think, sometimes too, too focused on developing the best rules and not thinking about the impact those rules can have. And sometimes it's better perhaps to be less detailed and more more, more global in terms of how you develop the, the norms and um, yeah. And Matthias, I, I just want to touch on also something that you, I think you hinted at a little bit earlier in our conversation that there are also rules that are on the books, but um, they're not implemented or perhaps they include significant loopholes. Um, are, are there learnings around that that you think we could uh, pretend that the rest of the world per perhaps could learn from? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that just including so the, the norm you're referring to is in the GDPR and the global and the general data protection regulation, where it says that um, yes, there is an, uh, a right to have insight into the logic of an algorithmic decision making engine if that impacts you if your data is being processed there but there's also this loophole that says this does not apply if there is a human involved at some point you know so it's it's unique it's only if it's automatically if there's uh, automated processing so i think that it's it is not a good idea to um to tie the right to explainability for ai decisions to tie that only to um to decisions taken 
only by AI, only by automated decisions, uh, whatever you know, that is in practice. I think that we should at least have a sort of a, a, a leeway to say that uh, if, if an automated decision-making system was substantially involved in a decision, then this already um, uh, activates the, the right to explainability. That would be one important message that I could think of. Excellent, uh, thanks. Thanks for that. And, and so as, as we come to the kind of close of today's session, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just do a round with all of our uh, panelists and, and hear a little bit about um, what is kind of one thing that you think we ought to uh, lobby for uh, when it comes to, or, or encourage our governments to take up when it comes to uh, explainable AI. So, so for the people who are in the room with us, you know, what, what's the takeaway? What should I be um, you, talking to government stakeholders around, or encouraging them to do, or, or perhaps you know, if I'm a civil society organization, you know, where, where should we be uh, kind of taking a stance uh, when it comes to explainable AI? And, and I, I think. Um, this is particularly, I don't think it's a, a simple question, I just want to lay this out, because it sounds like this area is, is in its early stages, right, in, in some ways it's in its infancy, um, and so it's difficult to build uh, regulations around things that are in their uh, infancy, but if, if there was one uh, thing that you think we ought to be pushing for, we ought to be uh, um, encouraging our governments to take up, um, what do you think that ought to be, and um, Brian, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you first. So I'll be thinking from a uh, usability and technical uh, approach and, and uh, something also raised by one of the Q&A, um, which is how do we define what is explainable enough? Um, I, I wouldn't want to say that governments need to set the benchmark for what is considered that because it varies from community to community and domain to domain. Um, but it is good to set some kind of a framework where uh, you know different uh, yeah, communities can can uh, derive for themselves right what level of explainability um, for now right that, that we want uh, to have before uh, we agree that the the AI is safe enough for our use case and and that should be something that um, should be reviewed regularly as you know, the, uh, the XAI techniques uh, improve. So, so if I understand correctly, you're saying we should have a right, but we don't necessarily need to define the specific, let's say, um, manifestation of that right across all of the different cases because there's so much variance. But I think Yet. also we, we need to come yeah. up with some standards for that. So uh, I guess it's industry ah. or community driven standards to define what is uh, minimally explainable enough. And hopefully also if it can be simulated in a way that uh, companies and institutions want to compete to make their systems more and more uh, explainable over time. Excellent. Okay, so great. So, so standards being uh, a, a great pathway to that. Uh, thanks very much for that. Matthias, how about you? One thing that you think we ought to be pushing for? I think we should be uh, pushing for more societal engagement. You know, this is such an important question. We need to tell people much more about how AI, uh, well, the impact of automated decision on society. You know, when I when I when I teach my classes and, and tell them about you know the role that that automated decision making has on, for instance, the way that we communicate online on platforms, people tend to be surprised. You know, if you have the numbers from platforms suggest that between 98 and 99 percent of uh, all uh, first instance decisions on content regarding ranking regarding uh, uh, staying online or being put offline are being taken now by, by automated decision engines that's huge and we're not talking about that nearly enough so i think that already the act of promoting that issue as a as a key a uh, key, key decision um, to take as a society within the next uh, generation is something which we, which I would uh, think we should all promote. And the second thing is we, we talk so much about climate change, right? So ecological climate change. You know, there's an agreement this is an important issue, right? I feel that we haven't yet communicated enough that there, apart from ecological climate change, there's also something which we could call political climate change or social political climate change. So the changes in the way that we um, interact with each other and the way that uh, private actors have taken over substantial parts of public discourse. I think that this should also worry us a tiny bit more than it does. And we should ask um, where we should sensitize people for that and uh, keep the governments a bit more on their toes regarding how um, how they can provide positive reinforcement, more plurality also in private online spaces. 
Very interesting. So keeping keeping government on their toes, and and I, I, it sounds like really this is one of those areas which could sound very technical to people, but we need to develop that understanding so that we can actually have agency over what is happening as a society. Otherwise, it's you know decisions are made and it's too late uh, uh, really for us to to um, claw them back. Liz, on, on your side, what what is something that you think we ought to be pushing for? Yeah. So as with Matthias, I think it's not particularly about XAI, indeed, it's not particularly about AI, it's about uh, the different ways that algorithmic decision making is impacting our lives and not, not all of those algorithms are particularly smart. But I think we can borrow very heavily from what we have seen is successful in other domains. And if I refer to uh, consumer protection and the production of goods that are safe for people to use, whether it be physical goods like a, a baby's furniture or you know, Car, car seat uh, protection in, in, uh, for, drive, uh, for passengers and so on. Uh, and there, as well as the production of the goods, whatever that might be, we have various ways of asserting the certification and the um, assurance around the people producing the goods, the quality of the inputs, the processes, and so on. And so we already have a variety of legislative and regulatory arrangements that ensure the safety to the end user of what is being they are purchasing or what, whatever it might be. I think there are many analogies there for how we can structure the appropriate protections, and we are talking about protections. Um, there are, of course, some particular elements about the information economy and the you know, very large platform players that you've talked about. But I think that, uh, that recognition that we can borrow from existing frameworks and adapt is, is one. And uh, I think we also need to put, and perhaps it's a, a variant of what Matthias was saying, I think we need to put more effort into training end users, whether they be the regulators or the judges or the people directly interacting um, with what this um, new technologies do and do not afford. So I think there's, um, it's, it's easy to um, just rely on the technologists and as Brian and in fact, all of us have said, uh, including yourself, um, the technologists are really useful, but they're only one part of addressing the variety of problems. And we need a much more multidisciplinary and multi-layered approach. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Liz. So we've, we've got standards, especially around understandability. We've got awareness for the public. We've got training for the users um, so they really understand what they're using. Um, and then we've got this possibility for borrowing from existing frameworks from, from protection for, for protection, uh, uh, you know, regular regulatory uh, uh, approaches around this that are existing already used um, to protect us against other kinds of uh, challenges. So I want to thank uh, this. This brings us to the end of today's session. I really want to thank our three panelists for joining us. So we, we have Professor Matthias Ketterman, who is the head of research program at the Hans Bredow Institute in Germany. We have Professor Liz Sonnenberg, who's the pro vice chancellor for systems innovation at the University of Melbourne, Australia. And of course, we had Dr. Brian Lim, who's assistant professor of computer science at the National University of Singapore. Um, and uh, uh, mostly, I also want to thank everyone who has joined us for this uh, uh, entire conversation. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, this is part of a series of uh, webinars on this debate around uh, AI and explainability. Our next uh, uh, session will be on the protection of data rights for citizens and users. Uh, that is coming up in mid-June. Um, so look out for that. Um, and we would love to have you uh, as part of that session. Tina, I think has uh, a colleague, Tina has pasted a, a link into the chat uh, for you to join us there. Um, but otherwise, uh, thank you all for joining and I'm wishing you a wonderful rest of your day.